with me in your Bibles to the book of John. We're just going to look at a couple of verses this morning, something that uh, God's been really dealing with my heart about and something I've really been looking at. And really, I've had to ask myself this question. When I look at, when I look at God's command and when He commands me to love people, when He commands me to love my wife, when He commands me to love the love the people around me i have to ask myself do i really do that or do i just say it do i really carry out the love that christ wants me to have for our community that wants me to have for you all wants me to have for my family or is it just something that i say because the how the world paints love and how god paints love are two totally different things Two totally different things. And in fact, we, that's, that's why we, we, raise, we raise our kids and we somehow teach them that, you know, we, we have a responsibility to teach them what love is. Because if we don't teach them what love is, we'll allow movies and shows and books and all of these other things to teach them what love is. And it ultimately comes down to the fact that they say, well, love is a feeling. Love is something, even in the, in the fact that we, we use the phrase, I fell into love, it's almost an accidental thing. But the problem is, is what happens when the storms come and when the feelings are gone and when things seem to all be crashed down and all go wrong, then that's when love really comes through. Because if you're just going based on a feeling, when things get hard, you'll, you'll fall away. But if you're going based on a choice that you're going to choose to love, then no matter what goes through, um, no matter what you go through or what happens, then you'll stay and you'll stand firm. Uh, John chapter 13, we're going to be looking at verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Would you bow your heads with me for a word of prayer? Lord, we come to you again this morning. We ask, Father, that you would interrupt our schedule this morning. We ask, Father, that you would be glorified in all that we do, Father, that we wouldn't just go through the motions this morning. I wouldn't just, just speak my opinion on your word, or I wouldn't just speak what I think ought to be said, but, Father, that I would, I would yield to you. That's what it's all about, is yielding to you. And we pray that you would be with us and help us not just to hear the word and help me not just speak it, but Father, apply it to our lives, and I would apply it to my life, and that I would, uh, you would mend broken relationships through it, Father, that you would, you would heal through it, that Father, we would leave here stronger and encouraged, but challenged by your word, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, we look at, and it's been counted, that there's, there's roughly 59 one, one another commandments in the New Testament. When God repeats himself, it's not that he, that he forgets what he had said. Sometimes, and um, I, I, I've been accused of this as well, especially if I, if I get in a debate, well, you're just repeating yourself. And, um, and, and it may be, it may be, that I do to repeat myself, I'm repeating myself because I forgot that I already said that, or I'm repeating myself to put an emphasis on what I said, but God never is the one that he had forgotten what he had said. But if, if you go through and you're reading his word and time and time again, and, and even in these two verses, when God repeats himself, he is, he is reaffirming the importance of what he's saying. 
So if we just look in some of John's writings, I'm not going to go through all of them, but if you want to go back and look at some of these things, you see John 13, 34, love one another. John 13, 35, love one another. John 15, 12, love one another. John 15, 17, love one another. 1 John 3, 11, love one another. 1 John 3, 23, love one another. 1 John 4, 7, love one another. 1 John 4, 11, love one another another. 1 John 4, 12, love one another. 2 John 5, love one another. You notice that if we look at John 15, 12, it says, this is my commandment, that you love one another. That you love one another. And we say, well, okay, well, that, that's easy. I know what love is. I can do these loving things and, and done. I'll just check that off of myself. But you, but you notice that, that, that Jesus always tends to put a footnote there to qualify the love that he is commanding us to have. He's not commanding us to have a worldly love where when I say that I love you, it's just that I'm saying I love what you do for me. Uh, how many of us have, have we trained? And I know that we've got some young people in the crowd this morning. And here's the thing that once and what's been taught in Hollywood, in the movies, in a lot of these books is it says, oh, well, well, love is this feeling that you've just got to chase. But that kind of love will leave you empty, will leave you forsaken and will leave you always searching for something more always searching to try to get that feeling or get that experience back. But Jesus, when He says this, He says, This is My commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's the one that gets us, as I have loved you. Not that I'm not commanded just to love you on your best day. You're not commanded just to love me on my best day. I'm not commanded to love you when you do things for me or when you, or, or, or when you say something nice about me. But, you, but just as Jesus loved us, He commanded us to love one another. And how did Jesus love us? Jesus loved us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. While people were down there screaming at him, you said that you were the Messiah. You are the coming of the Messiah, and yet you can't even help yourself. If you're truly the Messiah, just pull yourself off that cross and we'll believe. While they were spitting in his face, while they were pulling the beard from his face, while they were smacking him, while they were mocking him, and, and just a week, a week earlier when they had come together and they were praising him. But then now those same crowds, those same people were spitting on him, beating him. And what was his reaction? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So if I'm going to love like Christ loved me, is even when people are spitting on me. Even when people are, are, are throwing false accusations my way. Even when people disagree with me, I am to love them. Even when we have disputes. You see, because for us to, to try to hide the fact that, that, that we would never have conflict or disputes, even in a congregation of our size, that's just that's crazy thinking. Because any time, even if there were only five of us in here, there's going to be conflict and disputes. But the reality is, how do we deal with that amongst each other? How do we deal with that? And, and, and loving one another is not always agreeing. It's not blindly following one another and just say, well, you know what, I love you, so just go out there and, and do what you want to do. I'm never, going to, uh, I'm never going to enter conflict with you. I'm never going to, we're never going to discuss sin or anything like that. That's not love. But Jesus commands us to love one another as He has loved us. John 15, 17, these things I command to you so that you will love one another. 
1 John 3, 11, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. He goes on and on to repeat himself time and time again to love one another. But in order for us to love one another, first of all, we have to understand what love is. God is love. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. God is love. I want you to take a moment because I know that we've, that's one of those things that we say a lot. That's one of those things that speak, it's, it's a popular saying and we try and it's just almost like it can roll off of our tongue without us actually giving mental assent to what we're saying. We're not saying that God does loving things, but we're saying that God is actually the very definition of love. Meaning that you are incapable of loving Anyone apart from God. Because we can't, we, now we can have our jaded views of love. We can have what we think love ought to be or what we feel like love is, but that's only going to go so deep unless we know the author of the, the, his very being is love. How amazing is that? His very being is love. He was not forced to love us. In fact, we can see that in the fact that He does not force us to love Him. People have a, people have a problem with the fact of why would a loving God, if you were to say, and we're, we're afraid to talk about how, how loving God is and that God is love, because people always come back with the, well, if God is love, why would He send people to hell? He doesn't send anybody to hell. They choose to go to hell. But He is not going to force you to love Him even if you choose Him and choose to be separated from Him, even through all eternity. He will not force you to love Him. You're going to make your own choices. I've heard it said, and I, and I, and I like this, is, is us submitting to God, it's us finally telling Him, all right, God, Your will be done, but us rejecting Him time and time again, eventually it comes to the point where God is going to say, okay, Your will be done. People have a problem with the, with the, uh, with the biblical teaching of election. They, they, say, they say, well, if, if some are chosen, then that means that some are not chosen. But the reality is, in our, in our flesh, if we need to think about this, is we would say, well, that's, that's injustice that some are chosen and some are not chosen. But the fact of the matter is, it's amazing that anybody's chosen at all. Because we operate under the assumption that some, some are deserving. None are deserving. None are righteous. Not even one. Not even on our best day. Not even in our, in our best dress. And not even in, in our, in, at the best state we've ever been. You know the best thing that you have to offer? The best thing that I've ever done when I would look at me and other people would look at me and say, Whoo, man, he really did something. You know what God says about that in comparison to his goodness? It's filthy rags on my best day. And people look at statements like that and they try to explain it away and they try, they, they say, well, that, if you just tell people that, then you're going to just beat them down and they're not going to respond and they're not going to be encouraged. But I don't know about you, but those things are some of the very things that are the most encouraging things I've ever heard. Because it sets me free when I know that I have nothing to offer Him. It sets me free that I know that I don't have to be my very best all the time because it's not based on my merit anyway. It, it sets me free to know that Jesus said He loves me without expectation that I would ever say that I loved Him back. He said yes to you without expectation that you would ever say yes to Him to the point that He will allow you to die and go to hell with your own free will intact. 
The good news is this morning, you can still choose him. You can still choose him. He will not force you. He will not, he will not supernaturally stand you up, make you come up here, make you repent of your sin. He will allow you to die in your sin if that's what you want. Because he said yes to you, but he allows you the opportunity to say yes to him. Oh, it's amazing. It should be freeing to us to be able to sit back and think, you know what? It's not based on my merit that he forgives you. It's not based on what I think that he should do on whether he forgives you or not. He offers it freely to whoever will repent of their sins, turn away from them, and embrace him as their savior. And friends, we have to get that right before we can love one another. Before we can serve one another. And again, I, say, I bring this up time and time again, and I'm sure that it crosses your mind. Well, why do you speak about these things to the early service? Because for the most part, it's saved people that show up here. And it may be true, I can't judge your hearts. But even if it is true and that if everybody that comes into this service time and time again, week after week, they're saved. And we need to be reminded of the gospel message every single day. Because even though you are saved, you encounter people every single day that are not. And it's easy for us to, to get in our, our safe little space here and we, we only hang around our Christian friends and we only talk to those people that are believers because we don't want to put ourselves out there. But the reality is every single day there are people that are lost, that are dying, that are going to hell. We can't make that choice for them, but we have to tell them. We have to tell them we have a responsibility. God is love. We talked about last week, last week being Father's Day and, and the verse that, that came to my mind, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. Heaven literally went bankrupt to get you. And now some people have put a spin on that and say, look how valuable you are. I must be something special for God to do that. And don't get me wrong, when he, he, paid a, he paid a price, and that's what gives you your value, but he didn't pay that price because you or I were significant or deserving, but him paying that price, that's what gives us our significance. That's what gives us our significance is him saying yes and choosing us. And uh, many of our, many of what were the texts that we're talking about this morning comes from the writings of John. And John was in the inner circle in his relationship with Jesus. His gospel focuses on the deity of Christ more than any of the other gospels. He, he loved Jesus. And he even refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, I know that the Holy Spirit authored every word written in the Bible, but God also kept the human observation and writing style completely intact. It's amazing. Go study your Bible and study how it came together and study all the authors and, and the different backgrounds and the things that you've got people in different parts of the world and you've got people that from shepherds to kings to fishermen and it's all the common, it's all the common uh, goal and all the common word that God is great and he's coming and he is sending the Messiah to save us. And for the most part, John's observations can be categorized into two things. Number one, the love of Christ. Number two, Jesus is God. 
If you want to summarize all of John's writings, you go and he said, you know what? Lo the love of Christ, how loving Christ is, how he focuses on, you can just, you can just see at the times when the way that Jesus dealt with people. He never, he never shied away from confrontation or he never shied away from calling sin, sin. But you know what? He didn't just condemn people and then leave them to themselves. He had a message for them. He had an opportunity that uh, to let them know you don't have to live this way anymore. You don't have to be that way. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. Friends, I'm tired of, of seeing people and spreading a message that is just, we've got freedom, we say we've got freedom, but the way that we live our lives is like we're still slaves. Have, you, have any of you ever felt like you're still a slave to your sin? And I know the truth. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think God is lying to me. But the reality of it is, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I was thinking about this, and this was on my heart yesterday, is, is have I submitted everything to him? I say that he's sovereign, but I, do I live it out as though he is? For the most part, the answer in my life's no. I say that, that he is sovereign, but do I believe that he's actually sovereign? I believe that he has saved me from an eternity of torture, but do I believe that he's able to mend the relationships that I have broken in my life today? Or do I believe that I've got to do something? I've got to be better. I've got to choose better. I can get myself out of this mess. It's craziness. Because I have a God that is not only sitting there, that is not only waiting, that is not only asking me, give me your shame, give me your guilt, give me your life, and I will make you a new creation. But I just leave him over there and I say, God, I, I got myself into this mess. I'm going to get myself out. I'm going to choose better. It's craziness. It's craziness when I choose my sin over Him. When I choose the sin that sent Him to the cross, that caused Him all of that pain, caused Him to go through all of that, and I choose that over Him. And, I, and then I, I expect that I'm somehow, I'm going to live by his word and love people the way that he loved me. Not in that place you're not. Not in that place I'm not. You see, because typically, when we say that we love people, as I said earlier, we're really saying, I love what you do for me. I love the way that you make me feel and so on and so forth. But Jesus' love was a costly love. As I've already quoted John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. He gave. It cost Him everything that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Love in today's culture has become meaningless, empty words, lip service. And that's the way that we've been taught to love. And therefore, for the most part, that's how we love God. We serve Him with our lips, but our hearts, where are they at? And, and friends, I'm talking to myself this morning more than I'm talking to anybody in here. Because I, I, I kid you not, God has been getting a hold of me and asking me, where is your heart? 
For the most part, where is your heart? Where are you investing in these things? Why are you so worried about the big picture and about what is going to happen and about what is going on and you allow yourself to get so stressed out and so worked up and he, and, and he says, when you say that you believe in my word and you say that you believe that there, there's not a single bird that falls from the sky that's not in his hand that he doesn't know. He knows everything. And yet, I, I say that I believe that, but I think, oh God, I'm just worried about this thing. I'm worried about these, these finances that are coming up. I'm worried about, I don't know what's going to happen here. The, the culture looks kind of shaky. And he just asked, do you believe me or you don't believe me? You've got a choice to make. See, because if we're going to make the choice to love, it's going to cost us something. We pray for revival. But is it just because that's kind of the churchy thing to do, to pray for revival? Because if we, if we really get revival, if we really have, have people that are surrendering their whole lives to Christ, and if we are really bringing people in by the droves that are getting saved, guess what comes after that? It's discipleship. And guess who they're going to look to disciple them? It's going to be you. And guess that's what what's that's going to cost you? It's going to cost you time and effort. It's going to disrupt our schedules. We're going to have to sacrifice some things. Because love costs something. Jesus' love cost Him something. And number two, Jesus' love was committed. John 15, 18, If the world hate you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. That very same world that God so loved hates the very gift that was given to set them free. It's easy for us to get distracted and thinking, well, we feel like we're doing the right things, but, but as a church, we're, we're not growing, we're not doing these things, and, and, we, and we try to follow what the world bases on success. And we think, well, you know, they, they must be successful because there's more people that are going that way. But I would remind you that what would be arguably the mo one of the most important things in all of Jesus' ministry, dying on the cross, you know how many people were there for Him that were still following Him? There were three. Thousands showed up for the miracles. Thousands showed up to be fed and to be catered to and to, and to kind of see his conflict with, uh, with these teachers and these rabbis. But when he was dying on the cross, his most vulnerable moment, when he was setting the world free from sin, there were only three. And when we look at that and say, well, Jesus' ministry was a bust. He only had three followers. Even those closest to him were denying him and were hiding from, from, the, uh, from the people that were persecuting him. They were running scared. I don't know about you, but the, the, one of the most solid proofs of the resurrection is the reaction of the disciples after he did what he said that he was going to do all along. You see, because he'd been telling them all this time that, you know, the Son of Man must be lifted up. I'm going to die. I'm going to do all these things, even to the point that Peter said, you know, I, I'll die. I'll die with you. He's telling them, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper in the next service. And why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper? It's to remember the price that He paid for you and what He did for you so that we wouldn't forget. He tells them this whole time, I'm going to die for you. I love you. I'm going to die for the world. And then He actually does it. 
and they scatter. They're fearful. They're hiding. They're not living like they actually believe that He's coming back. I don't know if they just weren't listening or if it's one of those things, oh, that's just, that's just Jesus talking. He kind of says crazy things like that. But then He actually dies. And they're hiding. And I'm sure trying to come up with some sort of escape plan because after all, we'll be next. We're His followers. And He was always kind of able to pr protect us because the heat was always on Him. But now that they've killed Him, they're going to come after us. And notice right after his death, they weren't sitting around waiting for him to come back. They were, they were trying to figure out, well, what do we do now that he's gone? But then he comes back. He comes back. And you'll notice, because they have a choice to make, he's come back. We have this man, he was dead, and now he's before us, he's eating with us, he's talking with us. So if he made that claim and it was actually true, then everything else that he must have said must be true. So we have no choice, though we're still scared. Every single one of them, with the exception of John, ended up being killed for their faith in Jesus Christ and the message of Jesus Christ because they finally got how to love people the way that Christ loved them. And John wasn't martyred because of a lack of trying. They boiled the man and then eventually just stuck him on an island to get him away from them. So my ask of myself and of you this morning is do we love people? Do we love one another the way that Christ loved us? Is it costing us something? Is it committed? Or do we wait until things get a little shaky or, or, or somebody makes us mad and then we'll uproot and go somewhere else or we'll go and just try to surround ourselves with people that only agree with us? We find a, uh, an example here in Luke 7, 36 through 47. It says, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind, behind him at his feet, Weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with, their, with her hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now what you see right there, you see somebody that's broken, somebody that gets it. Somebody that says, you know what, I know my life is trash. I know that I have nothing to offer, but I just know that he has the answer. But I do have this ointment, and I do have my tears. And notice that the Bible says the woman of the city who was a sinner. With the exception of Jesus Christ, everybody that the Bible talks about is a sinner. But this, this was her, this was her uh, status in society. She was a sinner. And, I, and we've got to take a, a long look in the mirror here at the, at the Pharisee's reaction. Because we may be proper enough where we don't say it outside, but if we had, if, what if we had somebody burst in here this morning, somebody drug-ridden and, and somebody that is, that is at very rock bottom, what would our reaction be? Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. I want you to know he thought to himself, he was being proper too. He thought to himself, if he only knew the type of woman that was touching him, 
If he only knew where she had been and what she had done, but he knew exactly where she had been and what she had done. For she is a sinner. And I love the fact that he thought to himself, but Jesus answered him out loud. And Jesus answered, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He answered, say it, teacher. And certain A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When he could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said, To Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil. But she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. See, a lot of people say, well, that's why if people with a powerful testimony, they can go out there and they can, they can love a lot because they've been forgiven a lot. See, the point of this is not the fact that the woman was forgiven way more than the Pharisee was forgiven, but he thought that she was. Even in the very tone that he used and the very title that he gave her, she's a sinner, implying that she's a sinner and I am not. How do we love people like that? The way that Jesus loved them. The way that Jesus gave himself for them. When we're just honest with ourselves, and when we have the heart like this sinful woman has, and we say, you know what, I have no answers, I have nothing, I'm just trusting that Christ is going to cover them. And I leave you with this in our text. And I ask you this question. How will they know who we belong to? How will they know? Well, if we build big buildings, if we have big budgets, if we're able to get nice things, or if we do great miracles, or if we do great works, or if we really invest in the community, in Jesus' name, Or what if we become good at apologetics? What if we really become good at defending the faith and every single time they have a a comeback, we can just cut it apart? But in our passage this morning, none of those things are listed. You can have those things. Apologetics is a great thing. I, 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 I am... I encourage you to go out and to, and to read some of these books and to listen to some of these speakers because you'll, you'll, you'll be affirmed in your faith, if nothing else, that we don't, we don't have a blind faith. Very, very sensible, very, very practical. But when it goes out, when it comes to spreading our message to the world and to let them know who we belong to, how will they know? And in his word, it says, if you love one another. That's a lot of pressure. If we love one another, that's how they're going to know. You want to change the culture? Let's love each other. You want to see people saved and see people come to Christ and see broken relationships mended? You know what we need to do? Love each other. If we're not known for anything else, I don't care about all of the other garbage. I don't care if we ever get the uh, the if we ever become the next popular cool thing. If but I want people to come in here and say, you know what, man, they love each other. 
Some of them are crazy, but they love each other. That's what I want to be known for. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we are so grateful for you. So grateful that you, you could have just left us to ourselves. That makes sense. Judgment to me makes sense for an unholy, unrighteous, sinful people. Mercy doesn't make sense to me. Grace doesn't make sense to me, Father. But you extend it in a way that only you can, Father. Help us to not only just be recipients of that grace, but help us to, to further that and to spread the message and to show people. And Father, help us to extend grace. Help us to extend mercy, Father. Help change my life that I would be the most loving, merciful, grace-filled person that anybody's ever met. Not so that people can look at me and think that I've achieved something great so I can just say, you know what? Look at God. Look at what He's done. Look at how He's changed a life. I want people to look at my life and say, well, if He can do it. Father, I pray that You would be with us in our next, in our next service as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, as we remember the price that you paid, Father, that we wouldn't just go through the motions and, and eat the bread and drink the juice and, 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 and say a little prayer, but, Father, we would remember and we will f repent and forsake the sins that we're holding on to so desperately ahead of you. Thank you for paying everything. And thank you for saying yes to us, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you very much.